Hello, and welcome to Off the Books, where we surf the uncharted waters of accounting, finance, risk, and wherever else the waves take us. This episode is brought to you by Workiva, the one platform that brings together financial reporting, ESG, audit, and risk teams, and lets you know how to best eat your kids' Halloween candy without them noticing. My name is Katherine Tsai, professional asker of questions and lover of venti soy chais. I'm looking forward to debiting a great conversation and I'm happy to have you with us. I'm also happy to have Steve Soder joining me. Steve, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course, I'm an accountant and Diet Coke aficionado, and I'm similarly very excited for today's episode. You, Catherine, and our old pal Josh Gurge had the opportunity to talk to Mike Nordvet, partner at the law firm Wilson, Cincini, Goodrich, and Rosati. And what did you end up talking about? We talked about the state of the markets, what was going on in the beginning of 2023, and what next year should look like. Well, sounds like it was an interesting conversation, and with that, Let's tune in to Past Catherine, Josh, and Mike Nordvet. All right. Well, I have a personal question for you. How did you get involved in capital markets? Uh, so, uh, you know, I've been practicing for about 20 years, uh, uh, started by uh, time at a New York firm, um, but you know, it, doing capital markets transaction. But my, my passion was getting an opportunity to work with you know, companies that, that really uh, understanding you know, the business and you know, you know, their objectives and sort of the entire enterprise. and. You really have an opportunity to do that at a place like Wilson Science because that's our, our whole focus. Um, and, and being part of a team and, and uh, you know, capital markets are, are, are great, but it's what's what's great about it is because it's it's sort of enabling um, you know, companies to 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 meet their their goals. And so, you know, helping people do that and in a way that they, they feel, you know, good about it is yeah. You know, uh you sort of articulating the story is uh, you know, re- re- rewarding as a lawyer. We're hoping to talk about the state of capital markets. Can you take us back to what it was like in early 2023, maybe what it's like now and what you expect for the year ahead? So early 2023, I'm not sure there were capital markets. Okay. Um, it's been quiet for a while. Uh, I mean, I would go back a little bit further than that. And, uh, you know, 2021, we're obviously off the hooks in terms of the amount of uh, how, how busy everybody was in terms of, you know, traditional IPOs, DSPACs. Uh, and things really sort of fell off the cliff in like the middle of 2000, uh, 20, you know, 22. Uh, and it's been pretty quiet, um, yes, yeah, since then. Some secondary uh, activity, but the new issue market has been really, really quiet. Interesting. Why? Why so? Well, a, a couple things. I think twenty one. I mean, this is all opinion based, right? So, <laughs> no, but I mean, twenty twenty one. There were a couple things. Late twenty twenty, early or through twenty twenty one. A few things. I think the SPAC vehicle got a lot of traction. You know, you could get that shell out there. You could. You could shorten down the time frame of getting an IPO out on the market quicker. So everyone kind of jumped on the bandwagon of using that vehicle. And then, you know, the SEC's kind of meddled into that. They've kind of proposed things now that have kind of adjusted that back to more of a traditional time frame. I think that was one of the things. And the market was favorable. Like there were a lot of favorable market conditions. When you look at everything that impacts valuations on stocks, like the stock market back then had high values. It was a good way to raise a lot of capital. Uh, so many people were going. It seemed like uh, I think Mike Bellin mentioned it earlier in the session that, you know, the SEC probably didn't have like the blades down as much, like kind of going through that. They weren't asking as hard of a questions. It was kind of an open market. And I think people took advantage of it. Yeah. That, I mean, it, it, Josh is right. I mean, the marketing conditions were really ripe for the new issue market, given the you know, both fiscal and monetary policy was really uh, constructive to you know, that type of investment. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it probably got into got to I was gonna say a little bit of a bubble. I yeah. really kind of a big bubble. Uh, and there's and we're sort of feeling the after effects of that and working through it. What about for the year ahead? Well we we we've, we've got obviously in the tech space where where we spent a lot of our time at Wilson Sun C D um saw a number of companies uh, get out over the last couple of weeks with ARM and Instacart mm-hmm. uh in Clavio yesterday. Um and it's it's interesting. Like there were sort of uh whispers that, that you know those deals were coming and I think that uh, encourage some folks who might already be in the in the queue to sort of think about you know getting things kicked off again, and maybe some folks that hadn't been in the queue to to start. Uh, and a lot of people were sort of waiting to see how you know those deals uh, you know uh, priced and traded. And it's so far so good. And hopefully, you know, that's going to continue. Um, my my guess is we might see a few more uh, before the end of the year, but probably only a few more. I think from what I see in our client base and and hear from other folks. Probably the you know, first and second quarter next year is when you're going to see a little bit more of a wave coming through. Interesting. Yeah. What are I, the conditions that would make that happen? Well, I think I think part of it is 
I mean, to Mike's point, like there were six quarters where like there was no IPO market. Like we came, we had that big one. It was like a boomerang effect out of 21. It was like we went from the best year ever to like yep. the worst year ever. And to, and then it's been slowly coming back. There, there was a lot of like turmoil that, you know, conditions like in the market that caused people to be hesitant. And to, I think to Mike's point, everyone's been waiting. Like, okay, who's going to be like the flagship that goes? And for probably at least the last two or three quarters, I think someone's been waiting to see, like, we need a couple big IPOs to like really think that this thing is open. I think they've hit. I think we've got people's attention. My, or the market's got people's attention with, you know, Instacart, these other ones that have gone. And just even from a what we've seen, just the activity has picked up to to his point. Probably 23, it's not like we're going to see a huge influx of like IPOs hit, but everyone's looking at 24 now. Like, hey, it's open. We think it's coming. We don't know how big this window is going to be. So like we're trying to get ready as quick as we can. And I think everyone's kind of shooting for early 24 to like make a move. Yeah, I think that's right. And and I, I think also part of it also goes back to sort of some of the, the policy questions. I mean, we had, you know, a big uh, run up in interest rates, which seems like it might have paused now. So I think on the investor side, people have a better sense of what that impact on valuations. And then on, on the company side, um, I, you know, I think there is a recognition maybe grudgingly uh, so that we're, we're sort of in a new world from a valuation perspective and, and sort of a resetting of expectations on, on both sides, which sort of allows people to start thinking about, you know, you know going back out. And, and to Josh's point, I, I, yeah, we'll see what 24 looks like. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it might actually end up being a relatively narrow window. I mean, the conventional wisdom always is a presidential election year. Yep. You want to try to price, in, you know, you know, relatively far in advance of, of November. That's not always been true. I mean, two, 2016 was actually not a, not a terrible year. Maybe because people thought something was going to happen and it didn't, like they were surprised that it didn't happen. So, but you, we'll, we'll see. I think this one might be a little bit different. No. Interesting. I feel like the market is a little bit of a self fulfilling. Like there's more emotion to the market than I think people realize. Like it has to have momentum. It has to like fill it out and all these things kind of like come into play. And it's kind of how good people feel about it at the moment, you know? And like to your point, the election could impact it. I do think we'll see a spurt of some kind. Like, we, it's been closed too long. Like, something's yeah. got to move. Like, we went back and looked at, if you look at 22, even kind of early 23, like, so many companies went to price and could never could never get through pricing. And so you got to figure that there's a pipeline there of people. Like, that pipeline's been sitting there ready to move if things are ready, you know, and policy's going to come. And finally, you look at all these things like inflation, you know, interest rates, things like that. Plus, you know, the company side, everything's kind of trending favorable again for the moment or looking better than it did a little while ago. So you would hope that like we can start this thing a little bit. Today's episode of Off the Books is brought to you by Workiva. In today's world, musicians can make money in several ways. And while it may seem simple, it's actually quite complicated. Seriously, just Google how musicians make money. For the sake of time, we'll only mention a few. Live performances, merch, and streaming royalties. And while there are always exceptions, most artists aren't making a living redoing their work. But as you might've guessed, we're here to discuss an exception. Recently, one musician's been seeing success redoing her work. You might know her all too well. These re-recorded albums are making quite the splash in the music industry, breaking new records, re-engaging fans, and making that money. But repetitive work in your audit and risk processes simply isn't benefiting you, is it, dear listener? If you're wasting valuable time chasing down evidence requests or manually updating SAS reports, then it's time to discover what Workiva can do for you. Automate all that awful stuff so you can spend more time on value added work. Audit and risk teams plus Workiva? It's a love story. Just go to workiva.com slash risk. That's W-O-R-K-I-V-A dot com slash risk and say yes. What sorts of questions are you getting from clients, the prospective clients? Yeah, a lot of it's, it's about uh, some of the tactical questions about what, you know, how to optimize the, for, for a window. Um, more often, though, it's, it's about hey, what, what, are the, what are the things that are, are going to allow me to have a successful IPO? And, and we've seen, you know, these cycles before in terms of, when things have been shut down, you know, what are the, what are the companies that come out of the gate first? Uh, and so spending, you know, a lot of time, you know, with companies that, uh, have sort of a, a balanced approach to both, um, you know, revenue growth and profitability, you know, those, those are going to be the companies that, I think come out, you know, relatively, uh, in, in the first part of the cycle. 
Uh, and then also, you know, companies that are sort of at, at scale. And so, you know, we're, I think we're spending you know, a little more time you know, with those types of companies uh, than, uh, you know, some of the uh, smaller, maybe a little more risk on, but, the, but, but we'll get to that part of the market as well. Well, I think private companies are dealing with some different questions than maybe they had to five years ago. We've got new regulations about cybersecurity disclosures, possibly climate disclosures, human capital. What sorts of advice do you have for companies as they're preparing to get ready and maybe disclose more than they ever have before? Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting. Like we, those those conversations come up all the time. I mean, if, if maybe I'm betraying some biases, but I, I think it's telling people not to be distracted by some of those other issues. I mean, they're, they're certainly important issues that you want to be focused on um, operating your company in, in, a, in a safe way for you know, for your customers and, and thinking about you know, various stakeholders. But fundamentally, from an investor perspective, it's all about you know, the, the core value proposition and how you operate your company and drive you know, value in that way. And so spending, spending your time focused on sort of the meat and potatoes um, issues and how you articulate that to the street um, will give you know, some attention to some of those other issues. I think um, <clears throat> I, we saw this about, I'd say about a year ago, you know, you've had this big ESG moment and it's like, okay, is it going to come into capital markets? Are we going to have to build that in? There was chatter about it. And then it's kind of like, we're kind of back to the regular way we do it. It's like, that's all good. Like that's a not, that's more of like, that's a nice to have at this point. But like to his point, we're focused on profitability. We're focused on good core operations and good deals are going to get done. If they have those things, they're going to move forward. If they're not like, there's just not as much like smoke and mirrors around it as much anymore. Like they want a good return on investments. They want good fundamentals and that's, what's moving it. I don't see investors. It's, I, I think it comes up, but I don't think it, I don't think it impacts the deals at all necessarily at this point where a while ago, it seemed like it might, but okay. it doesn't seem to have done anything. We end every episode with a fun closing question of the day. I want to ask both of you, cause I'm really curious if you were a company and you went public, what would be your ticker symbol? <laughs> Josh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. First. I mean, I kind of have like a dry sense of humor. Like I would do something to like raise some eyebrows. Like I would come up with three initials that really made people remember it or might could be maybe misconstrued, but they'd remember what it was. Oh, so, I, I bet you would. You know, I don't know what that would be. Yet, and I don't know that I want to like put that out in the market, but like that would be my intention. Yeah, let's cut you off right there. <laughs> what would yeah. be your answer? So, I, I like if, if I could, if there are any out there, I, I would love to have a single single letter uh, ticker symbol. Ooh. Those are those are pretty you know, OG, pretty cool. So that'd be that's, cool. That's what I, I mean, it almost doesn't matter what letter of the alphabet, just as long as there was just one. Yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for coming by. Thanks. Yeah. And thank you, dear listener, as always, for surfing along with us. I'm Steve Soder, that was Catherine Tsai, and this has been Off the Books, presented by Workiva. Please subscribe, leave a review, and tell your buddies if you like the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, please leave a note in the comments and let us know how we're doing, or feel free to drop us a line at offthebooks at workiva.com. Now, we'll be back next week with Workiva General Counsel Brandon Ziegler to talk about cybersecurity. It's going to be an awesome conversation. And in the meantime, surf's up, and we'll see you on the next wave. <laughs>